Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I am Stuart Gritman. I have a couple of thank yous. I'd like to thank our curator, Trey, for making this happen. I also have a big thank you to my librarian friend, Rebecca, who's with us tonight. If you don't have a librarian friend, you need a librarian friend. Because this librarian friend saved my ass with this talk tonight. So thank you, Rebecca. Oh, and I have a disclaimer. <laughs> OK, listen, guys. I may have inadvertently oversold the whole fop fight angle of this thing. I promise, there's a fight in the third act, and it's a good fight, but these guys are totally bourgeois, and they're not fops. Okay, hey, let's get into it, huh? Okay, in three acts, act one, the war of Austrian succession in three minutes or less. <clears throat> Four minutes or less? Okay, hey. Habsburg Emperor Charles VI behind me in 1740 got a very special visitor that year. It was the icy hand of death. Now, <clears throat> sucks for Charlie, but doesn't have to be a huge deal for the empire because from the time his child was born until the day that the emperor died, he was raising this kid to be ready to slot right into position and continue leading the empire just as he had. Shouldn't be a big problem. Let's all welcome Maria Theresa. Shouldn't be a problem, right? Okay, so the Habsburg territory of Silesia had a problem with, uh, with this. They, what they surmised was that Maria Theresa lacked the human reproductive organs that are vitally necessary to leading an empire. And they said, we'd prefer someone with different organs. And infighting ensues. So back in France, next door, uh, King Louis sees an opening. It is not the Glaswegian Louis who can't remember his number. <laughs> it's this one, Louis the Fifteenth. He sees infighting with the Habsburgs and thinks, hey, this is a great chance. If they're fighting with each other, I can go attack them. I can maybe get some more land. I can maybe get some spoils of war. And I can maybe bring down the Habsburg Empire, or at least weaken them so they're not nearly the rival to France that they are now. So that's what he does. He starts a war, and for the next eight years, pretty much all of Europe is fighting. And by 1748, they're all really tired of fighting. And so no one has solved any problems whatsoever, but uh, they just kind of agree to stop. So let's do a quick scorecard. How did things work out? Was the Habsburg Empire mortally wounded? Mm, no, sorry. Uh, they were a little weaker than they were, but they weren't going away just yet. And Maria Theresa still ruling like a boss. OK, new territory? Hell yeah, they gained a lot of new territory. They gained huge tracks of the Netherlands, <laughs> and in the peace agreement, they gave it all back. <laughs> okay, but spoils of war, right? Um, yeah, maybe they did get some spoils of war, but the fact is that by 1748, France was nearly broke, their economic system was in near ruin, and he had driven everything right into a hole. So, act two, it's not a contest. Back in Paris, the, the leaders of the city get together. They know the king has brought France to the, pr to, to the brink of disaster. The country's nearly broke. They need to sit down and figure out how are we going to respond to this very, very dire, terrible situation that our king has put us in. And what they came up with was, let's build a new great monument to our wise and mighty war hero king. And that's, <laughs> OK, great. I think it's patently ridiculous, honestly. Um, probably some of you agree with that. But the thing is, if you've ever lived under a monarchy, and perhaps particularly under a House of Bourbon monarchy, the rule is never stop kissing ass. <laughs> you will die if you stop. So they don't stop. They pull together an arts commission, and this, this commission is tasked with figure out what this great giant monument to our king is going to be and get it built. The arts commission doesn't want anyone's help. There's no contest announced. They don't want public submissions. They're like, we're going to figure this out, you commoners. But they get submissions all the same. And one came from the very south of France, from an engineer and an aspiring architect by the name of Charles-Francois Rebar. He takes a look up in the sort of northwest quadrant of the city and sees some land that isn't being highly utilized is at the ass end of some street called Champs-Élysées. And he thinks, hey, this is where we could build a huge, sprawling uh, garden with a giant monument right in the middle. And if you were to go there today, you'd see this big door to nowhere. But if Rabar had had, 
I'm probably getting my ass kicked for that, sorry. <laughs> but if Rabar had it's worth it. But if Rabar had had his way, he says, pushing the wrong button, it would be a giant ass elephant, every bit as big as the Arc de Triomphe. Massive. And here's what he says about it in his, in his own words, in his proposal. He says, I composed this garden to the glory of the king, to be placed on a mountain in front of one of his palaces, and to finish the view there agreeably. Its external form is taken in nature. It represents an elephant on the return from a conquest, richly harnessed, loaded with the spoils of our enemies, and bearing on a kind of ancient tower or pedestal, the figure of his majesty. Ah, badass. And Rabar, I think, was pretty shrewd in what he was doing, because he's saying basically, hey, let's pretend that last war wasn't a complete waste of lives and money. Let's pretend that we're not ceding all of our colonies to the countries around us who have better navies. And let's say we'll pretend that we're conquering these places that are very exotic to us in uh, the Asian continent, in the African continent, and we've got so much of their shit, we have to pile it up on goddamn elephants to get it back to France. Let's reflect the king's fantasies about being a true global emperor back to him because it's really not happening in France. <laughs> so, but, and that elephant ex exhibits all those things in spades. But if you were uh, the king or if you were a member of his court, you could do more than just enjoy this thing from the outside. You could head on in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Built into the head of our monumental elephant here is a throne room with a giant, you know, lavish golden throne. And from there, the king can look back towards the rear of the elephant into the ballroom and concert venue. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. You get to the ass. That's where the dining room is. <laughs> and this one is also just beautifully decorated as a, as a tropical forest. Uh, with s bird sounds in it, and it has this uh, amazing articulated table in the middle. So when you get to the end of one course, the table's gonna drop down below. The chamber below is where the servants work. They're gonna clear that course, they're gonna put the next one on, pop it back up, and the quality never has to interact with the help. <laughs> what could be better? Okay, and then coming back around, back to the front again, underneath that ballroom, there were a variety of bed chambers, and I'm reading between the lines here a bit, but I think it wasn't where you were necessarily expected to spend the whole night. <laughs> it's kind of just a pachyderm pounding pad for his majesty. <laughs> That's not the cheapest alliteration you're gonna hear tonight. <laughs> okay, and my favorite thing about, about the interior design of this elephant is that Rabar describes a stream, a water course, running through the inside of the elephant, starting at the ass for some reason, <laughs> winding through the dining room, the ballroom, eventually out the trunk where it becomes this beautiful fountain out in nature. So that was his idea, and he got turned down. He might not have even been turned down. They might not have even bothered responding to him, but certainly <laughs> the Arts Commission wanted none of it. And that would have been it, right? But here in Act Three, there's always someone somewhere with a big nose. So. 10 years goes by, it's now 1758, and um, an architect and engraver by the name of Pierre Pat finds a copy of these, uh, of these plans, and with Rabar's permission, publishes, publishes them in a booklet. So he writes a little foreword saying, hey, look at this great idea, I think it's cool, he compares it to some other monuments around the world very favorably, and, uh, and puts it out there for the world to read. And so, yes, if you're following along at home, Pierre Pat, having procured the plans, prepared and published a pamphlet pertaining to the Pachyderm Party Palace. Thank you. That's where the talk peaks, people. It's all downhill. All right. This guy, we're looking at Elie Freron. He gets a hold of, the, uh, of, that, of that booklet, and he... Uh, how to describe this guy. He's like, you know if you go to a city council meeting and there's one guy who's there every month and he's got some new inane thing that he is righteously indignant about? Okay, Freyron sort of made a career out of that. And to make it worse, he was staunchly anti-enlightenment and he would publish uh, these journals that run sometimes to hundreds of pages and he's not introducing new ideas. He's really just ripping on other people's ideas and saying how bad everything is. So, mean-spirited guy, huge ego. Oh, and he would pick fights with fucking Voltaire, okay? 
Yeah, I don't need to tell you who came out to the advantage in those. So he turns his vitriol towards poor hapless Rabar in two essays that year. In one of them, he outright says Rabar is plagiarizing this elephant monument idea. And his, his, the closest thing he has to evidence is that he finds a drawing from 1561, 200 years ago, where someone said, hey, look, we could make a little thing with an obelisk. And it's really about a fifth the size of what Rabar was proposing. There's no room for like interior space. Rabar's didn't have an obelisk. So ha if he had seen it, and we don't know if, if Rabar did, but if he had seen it, um, it certainly isn't like abject plagiarism. He might have you know, borrowed the idea, but, but really developed it into something his own. And in the second essay, um, Freyron says, uh, okay, look, if this, if this elephant thing gets built, everybody's gonna wanna have crazy animal houses and it's gonna be the end of civilization. <laughs> and they're gonna look like vultures and turkeys and magpies and crocodiles and mackerels. And he really wants us to think that society's gonna crumble if we have whimsical houses. And so, you know, that doesn't fly with me. I don't think it flies with the kids who get to go to kindergarten and his cat. I think that's really cool, right? But so, Rabar's been attacked and he feels like he needs to come back at Freyron and he doesn't quite have the equipment to do it, but he gives it a go. Okay, so, similar product. Rabar's retort wasn't exactly like a Voltaire grade takedown. He, he, calls, he calls Freyron malignant, he insists that he didn't plagiarize, and then his attempt at a coup de grace basically boils down to, well, Freyron, if, if you lived in an animal house, it would be made of all kinds of parts of all those animals you named, but not the good parts and the bad parts so there. <laughs> yeah, and that's pretty much the last anyone ever heard of Rabar. Oh no, okay, so poor Rabar, our very weak protagonist. <coughs> His architecture dreams died with him in 1807, but, okay, not only was that elephant never built, nothing he ever designed was ever built. <laughs> yeah, I know, dude died broken alone. Sorry, Rabar. But listen, it's not all bad news, people. We have a little bit of redemption here because not 80 years after Rabar's death, a monumental elephant was built in his style, something big enough to live inside of. Now, it wasn't Paris that picked up the idea, Tokyo, New York, Beijing, all these great monument cities. No, this was built on the goddamn Jersey Shore. <laughs> yeah, USA. This is Lucy. So, and it, I only learned this after I had pitched this talk and started writing it, that later this month, for the first time in years, it's gonna be available to rent for three nights. So three couples are gonna get to have their own real pachyderm party palace. <laughs> I'm sure pounding is optional. <laughs> and it's gonna really happen, so that's kinda cool. So we usually wrap these up with a toast. Um, I gotta tell you, I don't really wanna toast to any of those guys I've been talking about. They're not the most inspiring characters out there. So let's instead, drink to our audacious ideas. Let's drink to maybe trying to make those things happen. And to the blowhards of the world, like Freron, let us say, straight to hell. <laughs>